Hey y'all, Andrew Reed, Mossy Greek Mushrooms, and today I want to go over Horisiums. I have no idea if we're going to have something cool for that or not. I may have just gone like that for no reason. Either way, <laughs> Horisiums. Horisiums are <clears throat> a type of mushroom genus. That means that it is the classification above species. Horisiums are typically, they start off as like a little just a glob a little blob growing and then they'll either branch or grow in a globular fashion it means a globe right round sphere like a ball and then they grow teeth instead of gills or pores or anything else that might be a spore producing structure Horisiums are very 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 <laughs> prolific spore producers now i don't think i've ever done a video on Horisium before yeah, I don't think I have. And that's crazy talk to me because I love Horisiums. They're one of my favorite things in the world to grow. I'd say at any given time, off and on, we're growing about 20% of our crop as Horisium. Um, we sell it at a higher price, about $4 more per pound to restaurants. It is a prolific grower. Um, and the flavor and the texture are just incredible. Very crab-like, or if you're getting our comb tooth, it's very lobster tail-like mushroom. Some things about Horisium in general, especially when it comes to cultivation, is that it fruits readily and its mycelium looks anemic or weak. Um, it is not weak. It is quite the tough little critter. This said, you'll notice that if you clone a, mush a wild or even cultivated fruit and then place that on an agar dish, it likes to fruit almost off the fruit. It takes a long time before it reverses direction and starts producing the mycelium that you're after. Now, I found a little tip slash trick with this. Play, place your clone on your Petri dish. Let it fruit off of that a couple of times. When it finally starts producing mycelium... Sorry, that's my phone. Not yours. But once you have your fruit uh, cloned there to the Petri dish, and it's, it's finished fruiting and fruiting and fruiting, you then take that uh, mycelium that it's now starting to grow off the base and just run it to another plate. Throw the other plates away. Once you see that growth is actually happening on your new plates, pens that start to rot are a treasure trove for contamination. So get rid of that stuff. And once you have the mycelium running, you got to keep it running or it will fruit again. You have to just keep it going. It loves to, Horisium loves to fruit. Now, one of the things to consider with this, um, I actually did not know this. I, I read it in Peter McCoy's book, but I, I had figured this out beforehand. And when I read that, I was like, oh, yeah, I've experienced that. Horisium does amazing in liquid culture. It is the primo candidate for liquid culture. And every Horisium strain I have ever had turns your, your liquid culture darker and darker the more it ages and matures. Until sometimes it's hard to see through. It's beautiful. Um, but kind of annoying. <laughs> this said, the constant agitation of liquid culture oftentimes will help keep the the uh, her, the herisium from fruiting on the top of the the surface. Um, if you've got still water, mycelium can form colonies on the top and then fruit off of those. And herisium loves to do that. So just keep your culture stirring, stir them every day or every few days, uh, but stir them as often as you can, please, or you know for your best results. Now again. I'm just telling you guys about my experience. I'm not really telling you the way to do it or the right way to do it. Uh, here at Mossy Creek Mushrooms, we do everything wrong. We just try to do it less wrong every time we do it. So we, we are never in the right. <laughs> now that you guys know that Horisium likes to fruit, one of the, the tricks to cultivation that I have, uh, that I like to use is we, we inoculate our grain with liquid culture. Give it a few days, shake the bag, and then usually our liquid culture is ready to use in seven to 10 days. Um, so our grain bags, did I say liquid culture? Grain bags are ready to use in seven to 10 days. The, you won't see a lot of mycelium at this stage. It's very, in fact, I've got some probably, well, I can't see them directly behind me, but the, uh, the herisium that we have or almost all herisiums that we have uh, worked with will try to pin 
prematurely in the bag. You do not want that in spawn. You do not want pinning um, herisium spawn. You want that as quick as possible. Um, so as soon as you see growth all the way across the bag, even if it's weak and anemic looking, run it. Send it. Um, you do not want it to pin. Same with fruiting blocks. Our fruiting blocks will oftentimes incubate for only 7 to 10 days and then go in the grow room. Um, this does not speed up the, the quickness of which you'll get fruit, um, but what it does is um, we are, you know, with our herisiums, we do something like a week less in incubation than our oysters and a week longer in a grow room than oysters because they actually take about the same amount of time to get fruit as oysters do. But we like to initiate them so that we can control pinning better because the herisium just loves the pin. Keeping them in the dark helps too. Now, um, some pros about herisium. They are typically heat tolerant, especially all the herisium in our bulk pack, which I'll put the, the link down below. In particular, Dyson Sphere, Sabertooth, Mammoth Tusk, and Fractal are the four strains I know of. They were cloned in the middle of August during one of our the most oppressive heat waves I've ever seen here. Uh, and I've lived here my entire life. Um, and they just did phenomenally. Uh, in fact, we've had people who get Dyson Sphere and sometimes can't fruit it if their room is down to 55 or something, or 60. It likes the heat. It's growing quite well for us right now. Uh, Sabretooth as well, Bear's Head, uh, our grow room's being about 77 degrees right now because, again, we're having one of the strangest years I have ever come across when it comes to heat. It is just so hot so early this year. I didn't know we were going to have August and May, but we did. So <laughs> we're, we're adapting, and herisium is one of the ways we adapt to that because herisium kicks butt in the summertime. Um, it almost always does. There, I'm sure there are cool weather strains, but I've not really come across them yet. Uh, so that's that's one of the pros is that they like warmer weather. Another pro is that they just produce and produce and produce and produce. It doesn't matter that your block is running out of water. For some her reason, herisium will just keep spitting out fruit forever, over and over and over again. So it's it's one of the beautiful things about it. Now, and especially if you if you keep the pen the um, the pens from performing before you want them prematurely uh you won't get a lot of contamination with uh with herisiums you will sometimes see something called the black death black death is you so anybody who knows <laughs> herisium in fact let me put it to you guys this way herisium is one of those mushrooms that so many people grow the first time and they're like this is easier than oysters oh my gosh why don't i grow all herisium what they don't realize is herisium is absolutely easy it's, it's considered a beginner mushroom it's very very easy to grow it's harder to grow than oysters consistently so oysters kind of find a way to muddle through even when you mess up the herisiums they're just waiting and they'll wreck your crop um now part of this like if you have if you don't take care of your premature pens if you don't have clean blocks or if your culture is dirty you can i mean there are a lot of vectors for this and i i don't I haven't nailed down the vector for this could be flies could be all kinds of things one of the things that we see the most common contaminations that we see with herisium is called the we call it the black death i don't actually know what it's called i don't know what it is i don't know if it's bacterial fungal viral i don't know but it'll make your mushrooms shrivel up turn black and then start leaking I mean, leaking like they're melting. And that contamination spreads. It's very virulent. And it, it spreads mainly in a vertical line. So if you've got, if a block up here, you know, gets that black death, it'll drip on every block below it and contaminate every single one of those. I have found nothing to salvage blocks with this. No burning, no churning. Just pull the block out. In fact, uh, you know, get a, a clean bin with a lid on it put it on your cart open it up throw that stuff in and close that bin and get it out of your room that stuff is terrible we call it the black death for a reason uh, i have seen several strategies to combat this one is that uh, some growers i know have put the herisium blocks on the very bottom uh, shelf of their grow room all the way around and when they do this because it spreads so easily vertically because if it's a drippy thing um 
you know, if one of them gets it, it just goes down on the floor and they don't have to worry about it. I find it's a little bit annoying to have to keep up with my crop in that kind of fashion. So we still just do block walls and just try to be very careful and catch it early. Like I said, you'll see it. It turns black. Oftentimes if we see it and it's dripped on a mushroom, but that mushroom below it is not bad looking yet, we just go and pull it because we know it's going to go bad. So just early, early spotting. And if you're not doing daily walks through your, you should every day that you go to work, you should walk your op and look for contamination or problems and you should future solve. That helped me so much when I was a grower. Um, <clears throat> one of the interesting things about this black death though, is that it gets real foamy looking and uh, that foam bio sludge, whatever will drip down to the floor and we cleaned it up. And as we cleaned it up, it left this just bare spot on the floor, wherever it had been and been sitting. I mean, completely clean right down to the paint beautiful that room had not looked that clean in forever and there was just this beautiful clean spot now interestingly enough i think that might be hydrogen peroxide i don't know samantha's after me to try to really figure this out and see if it's a cleaning product that we could market and sell um anybody that wants to work with that on me let me know we'll see if we can't figure it out i've got to get a swab of the black death and then purposely inoculate some blocks with it and see if i can't control the infection in order to test it. However, it really does clean well. Um, and I don't, I think it's the mushrooms defenses. Um, it, it's immune system. It's producing hydrogen peroxide, which we know mushrooms can do, uh, to a degree. And they produce that hydrogen peroxide, try to kill as much of the, the invader as possible. Drippy drip got on the floor and that's where it, you know, we saw that cleanliness come from. And as we know, hydrogen peroxide, does clean stuff very well <laughs> so uh bleaches things very well too now black death smells it's got a very distinctive smell very rot death smell to it uh i don't really know how to tell you so that you'll know it right off the bat but it does not smell good and people in this business i feel like have pretty much learned the nose nose and trust your nose you walk in, you'll smell contamination. Mushroom mop should not smell bad. If it smells bad, there's something wrong. It should smell pretty good. Um, now that said, we occasionally we'll get something that smells bad that we're working through. Whatever. We're not going to get into the medicinal side of things about herisium today. I just wanted to go over the very basics of it. So we're going to stay on medicinals because the science behind that is a messy hellhole that I am not approaching. Uh, I'm not really interested in medicinal stuff anyways. Uh, I like herisiums just fine on their own. So for the taste and the flavor, taste and the flavor, the smell and the flavor, <laughs> the taste and the smell. <laughs> but I really do enjoy herisium just on their own. I don't know it need a reason to ingest them. I just ingest them. Like if I wanted to powder them and put them in capsules and take that, uh, you know, on a regular, I, I don't have an, I don't need an excuse to do it. I'll just do it now. I will say there is a lot of bad science, so be very careful in your claims about herisiums, uh, in particular lion's vein. There's a lot of bunk science out there. There is some good science in different areas, so I'm not touching it beyond that, but you guys are welcome to chat all you about it all you want in the, the comments down below. If I'm wrong, let me know. If I'm right, let me know. <clears throat> um, now, as I've said, we want to get to stuff as it before it fruits. And as I've said, the liquid culture is the best way to do that. One of the things I have come across about liquid culture is that herisium seems to be, like I said, the primo candidate for it. It is the easiest mushroom to take from liquid culture to direct to bulk substrate. So far in, in what I've been doing, it's very, very easy to do that. So, in fact, that's the way they're grown a lot in uh, some other countries. And I think Asia in particular. <clears throat> and so it, it ends up being um, a good candidate if you want to mass produce off of, off of LC. Now, you know, if, let's say you're growing some lion's mane and you want to know what to do with it. I will give you a quick rundown. I, I don't have any B-roll of this, and I do hope to make a video for this coming in the fall. But soup beans, oh my goodness. I grew up with my grandfather. I uh, lived with him. I lived with my parents too. We all lived with my grandfather and grandmother. <clears throat> and Gramps had, uh, you know, heart condition and stuff. So low sodium. I, I grew up on low sodium. 
to this day, uh, I still don't like the taste of a lot of salt. I like very low salt foods typically. Um, I know I'm weird for that, <laughs> but, uh, one of the things I've done is that I don't like a lot of salt in my soup beans like a lot of people do. So I use soy sauce and fish sauce as my salt source. So we do beans. I don't know how you cook them here in, uh, you know, where I've come from, we, we tend to just take the beans and soak them for a little bit. Uh, I don't change my water out. A lot of people do, but I like a more rich flavor to my beans. And then add your your soy sauce your fish sauce take your mushrooms tear them up into little pieces throw them in there um and then throw in a big ham bone with plenty of meat on it render those beans down until soft and then eat to your heart's content it is amazing and those mushrooms and soy sauce do something incredible together now really quickly with with that said if you want to make it a vegetarian dish just take the the fish sauce and the the uh ham bone out and it's still going to be really good i've had it in the vegetarian way and it's really good especially when you spice it up with some turmeric and garlic and uh you know onions and things like that it's no longer the same old kind of soup beans you know pinto style but uh i like mixed beans anyways so that is a really good way and to cook up some mushrooms you can cook it for as long as you cook the beans you know if you're cooking for two hours uh four hours whatever those mushrooms are not going to be overcooked. They're going to just continue to render down. And I've had them so soft that they're almost like silk when you're eating them. So we have a herisium bulk pack. Uh, contains nine different strains of herisiums. I highly recommend it if you want a variety. There's all kinds of shapes, sizes, flavors, textures in there. Uh, heat tolerances. There's, as I said, Dyson Sphere, Sabertooth, Fractal, and... Mammoth Tusk <laughs> are the four that I know perform exceedingly well in the heat, but any Herisium will do that. But I will put that link down below so that you guys can give that a try. Also, I wanted to go over what we grow it on typically. Uh, we grow our most things on the goat mix, but I will say that we have seen a marked improvement on Herisium. Oysters seem to perform better on the goat mix, but the Masters mix is still what we are growing the herisium on it's oak and, and soy uh, we do some straw with the the herisiums but they just definitely they definitely don't like the straw as much as they like the sawdust in fact uh just sterilized sawdust seems to be a pretty good fruiting source for them they don't seem to need as much supplementation as a lot of other strains do to produce well that said you know the masters mix still makes them for some huge clusters the only thing I don't like about Lion's Band and the Masters Mix is that certain strains, um, in particular at certain times of the year, will go bitter. And Comb Tooth never goes bitter that I've experienced. So we prefer Comb Tooth to Lion's Bane just for that because it's easier just to grow a massive amount on it on a really good substrate uh, or, or two and get really good sweet results with it. And that's what we're after. Plus, the Comb Tooth's got that nice lobster tail texture and flavor, which I prefer to the crab uh, texture and flavor of the more bulbous varieties like bear's head and lion's mane. Though bear's head is unique in and of itself in that I like when the tops start to go brown, it starts to put off this like, maple syrup smell in the grow room or this really sweet syrupy smell. Don't know why. It's just odd and that that one strain in particular does it. Uh, but it is gorgeous smelling. <laughs> delicious smelling i'm not sure it's just really good smelling another reason to grow herisium is that they tend to have a higher protein content now i know mushrooms are calorically the same as salad <laughs> you're not really getting much calories out of it they do have some carbohydrates but it's like 80 to 90 percent water so it's all by dry weight when you're talking about this so 30 percent of 10 percent of the weight might be protein you know something like that so uh, it does seem to be that herisiums have a closer to 30 percent protein content by dry weight than oysters oysters tend to be somewhere around 10 15 percent from what i've seen so obviously if you're growing for protein lion's mane is the way to go though you know something else other than mushrooms is the way to go if you're going for that vitamins minerals mushrooms are a powerhouse active unique compounds mushrooms are a powerhouse flavor texture wonder mushrooms are a powerhouse 
So <laughs> you can't really go wrong with them, especially if you're adding them to other things. So with that, y'all, I would like to point out the hat. Uh, Samantha made me this hat. And then uh, I liked it so much, she put it on the website. So this is our mush rune hat, our grow rune hat, um, our grow room, grow rune hat. Uh, it's modeled, I've always thought of it like, um, in our group, we, we talk in runes a lot. We like write letters to each other sometimes, or Span I'll write Samantha a love note in uh, runes, and then she'll have to decipher it and then try to write me one back. Um, and of course, I can read it you know just fine but we do a lot of bind runes just symbol pictograph runes and one of the things i've noticed is that in a lot of cultures throughout the world when you think of growth and abundance it's almost always put in a plant form right it's always put in something recognizable which you know is that plant form but what if to a different people to us maybe mushrooms are what represent growth you know, I have found that as I'm a mushroom grower over the years, I have learned to dislike summer as a farmer and love winter because winter is when my crop is growing the best. It's whenever my costs are down and my profits are up and life is easier and I'm eating high on the hog. And, you know, summer becomes this slog where you're just trying to make it day to day and you know, cure one thing or another, or pre always constant prevention and just cleaning, 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 cleaning like crazy. And you get reprogrammed, right, to like that. So what if we reprogrammed it, you know, this way to something fungal? So this is just based off of a handprint, like what you see in caves and whatnot. Oh my gosh, that angle to the camera. <laughs> there we go. Just like that, I just, you know, had a hand, you know, kind of put up to represent one of those old ancient human symbols and then tried to uh, nokify it so that's my bind rune for growth for growth mindfulness right we put that on the grow rooms when you're walking into there it's a reminder to me this is a space to grow things this is a space where you need to be in that mindset of of uh growth and and taking care of those mushrooms and making sure that they're um they're not going to take care of you if you're not taking care of them. So that's what that represents. Samantha does have these available. So if anybody wants a cool hat, I like to wear mine when I'm biking, which is why it's all dirty and stuff right now. This thing keeps the sun out of my eyes. And uh, I think I look quite charming with it. So with that, y'all, keep spawning culture. <laughs>